Um, hi, everyone. Our next speaker is a prolific author, an activist, and public speaker. He has passionately advocated for human rights in prison, and he has given many talks around the world where he has shared interesting experiences and lessons from his time in the drug trade and from his time in prison. Please welcome Sean Edward. In 2004, in the Sonoran Desert, Arizona, I was serving a nine and a half year sentence for running an international ecstasy trafficking ring. Deserved my punishment, take full responsibility. I was moved from a supermax prison over to medium security. I'm thinking, medium security? These guys have got to be a bit softer than in supermax. But the guard who moved me had other ideas. He decided to play a prank and put me in with a guy who was a serial home invader, torturer. He was breaking into people's houses and taking hammers to their kneecaps. Welcoming statement to me. I've got a padlock in a sock. I can smash your brains in while you sleep. I can kill you whenever I want. Now they say prison is like high school mentality with deadly consequences. And he knew my family was flying 5,000 miles to visit me for Christmas. So he had his friend, this big gang member, sneak up behind me just as I'm walking to this visit to see my mom and dad. I'm just as excited as can be walking down this corridor. Big guy sneaks up behind me. Bam! Starts kidney punching. All the prisoners stop to see my reaction because gang rule is, you must hit back or else you're a punk and everyone's going to prey on you. But if you do hit back and the guards see it, you're arrested, sent to a prison within the prison, locked down, you lose all your privileges, including your visits, and they can add more time onto your sentence. But if you don't hit back, if you become a punk, you're going to spend the rest of your time inside cleaning people's toilets, performing sexual services, and getting rented out as a prison prostitute. So, I had no choice. I started throwing some kicks and punches. It was like hitting a big bag of cement. And he was trained in kickboxing. Smash me up, knock me down. I go visit all injured. Mom's asked me what's wrong and I can't say because she's already had a nervous breakdown of my situation. When I get back from the visit, my cellmate is getting higher on heroin and crystal meth. 90% of the prisoners were shooting up the hardest drugs. He's showing me the padlock in the sock that he's going to smash my skull in with. I got so scared, it was the only time I called for outside help. I called my family and said, look, can you put a call into the British Embassy? See if they'll call the prison and try and get me moved. Because I think this guy's going to try and kill me. But when they call the prison, they can't say anything I've said that would get him in trouble. Because that would make me a snitch. It's KOS, kill on sight for snitches. Everyone's going to want to kill me. Fortunately... The embassy handled it appropriately, and I was moved without getting him any trouble. He's throwing batteries at me for a couple of weeks afterwards, until I got a new cellmate who went up and had some words. Now, my new cellmate knew there was a guy in there who could protect me, called Two Tonys. But he didn't tell me this. He came up with another strategy. He said, will you play chess against my friend? I said, yeah, what's he in for? His name's Two Tonys. He's doing 141 years. He left the dead bodies of rival gangsters from Arizona to Alaska. Never harmed any women or kids. He said they all had it coming. I'm like, whoa, 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 hold on a minute. If I play chess against this guy and I beat him, I might be next on his list. He's like, no, I'll go and get him before I had a chance to stop him. So there was a hierarchy amongst the murderers. If you've murdered a woman or a child... It's KOS for those guys, kill on sight. The prisoners try and kill those guys when they come in. Because two Tonys had only murdered rival gangsters, he was top of the respect in the prison. So my cellmate, Long Island, figured, if this guy likes me, takes me under his wing, I'm going to get the protection. So I'm stood in the day room, nervous, over the chessboard. And two Tonys comes down. He's served almost 30 years by now. He looks like Uncle Junior out the Sopranos. And he sees how nervous I am, and he immediately put me at ease in a fake British accent, asked me if I'd ever had bloody tea and crumpets with the Beatles. <laughs> so I beat him at chess, and at the end, he goes, how come you beat me so fast? 
I said, because you kept speaking your mind throughout the game. You wouldn't show someone your hand in a game of cards, would you? He slaps his head and goes, oh, me and my big mouth. Me and my big mouth. But I didn't understand. He'd been testing me. And he said, look, Sean, to stay alive on the road of life, I've had to become a quick judge of character. I like you. I think you're an honest guy. Would you be willing to write my life story? And I said, yes, I will be honored. Now, how did two Tonys know I was a writer? I'd spent 26 months on remand before I got sentenced to nine and a half years in Sheriff Joe Arpaio's infamous Maricopa County jail system. This is a place where there was dead rats in the food, cockroaches crawling all over at night times. They weren't big on human rights. I'm not saying it should be easy. Like I said, I deserve my punishment. But guards murdering mentally ill prisoners. Brian Crenshaw was classified as a partially blind shoplifter. They brought him in. The guards asked to see his ID. He failed to produce it. They pulverized him, broke his neck, severe internal injuries. He went into a coma. He died over a month later. Scott Norberg, mentally ill man wandering a neighborhood. They brought him in. They started to beat him up and electrocute him with taser guns. A female guard tried to stop it. Stop beating him, his face has turned blue. They ignored her and they kept beating him. Then the inmates started yelling from the holding cells, why are you still beating him? He's already dead. And even after that, they continued to beat the corpse. Those cases were caught on camera. Family members of the victims sued the jail and were awarded compensation. Some of the guards who were found responsible for those deaths were actually given promotions and pay rises after by the boss, the sheriff. Because I had female co-defendants, I knew what was going on the women's side as well. Deborah Brayhard was a diabetic. She was in for shoplifting. And her daughter was calling the jail all morning long. My mom needs a medication. She's got diabetes. They were like, tough. It's jail. And she started having seizures and she was flopping around on the floor and the guards were just walking around her and they just let her die. One woman was pregnant, sat on the toilet, had a miscarriage and she collapsed on the floor. The guards come in, revived her with smelling salts, ordered her to fish the dead baby out of the toilet and didn't give her any medical treatment whatsoever. Yeah, so this was the, the standards in this place. So I asked the guard, how on earth do you guys get away with all these human rights violations? And the guard said to me, the world has got no idea what's going on in here. So I decided to make an effort to change that. I was in my second year of incarceration now in maximum security. And I was allowed a tiny little pencil like you see in a betting shop. It's called a golf pencil in America. And sharpening it on the door, I started to write everything down. I couldn't put these things in the mail because the guards can open the mail. But my aunt was visiting me in maximum security. So we figured out a system where she would smuggle them out of the jail. Now in maximum security, when you, you get a visitor, you're sat at a table, handcuffed to the table with one hand. On the other hand, you've got a phone. And there's a plexiglass window. And she's on, my aunt is on the other side, so I couldn't hand anything to her. So I hid what I wrote in legal paperwork and old letters that the visitation officer at the end of the visit would hand to my aunt. So the first time I took that stuff up there, I'm watching over at the guards table, nervous, thinking he's going to see it. But they're trained to look for contraband, syringes, cash, drugs. He didn't see what I'd written down. So at the end of the visit, that was handed to my aunt. She took them home, typed them up, emailed them to my family in England, and they put them online as a blog called John's Jail Journal. Not in my name, obviously. John, so that the guards wouldn't know who I was writing these things. Now, the blog did go on to attract international media attention to the conditions, and that jail was closed down a couple of years later, the, um, the maximum security Madison Street Jail. And people sometimes say, Sean, why on earth do you want to get conditions improved for prisoners? The paedophiles, murderers, rapists, robbers. And I completely understand why people ask that, because that's what I thought prisoners were as well. All you hear in the news are extreme crimes on one side, 
and how easy it is on the other. They've got Playstations, they've got gourmet food, they've got luxuries. Once I got into the system, I saw that the vast majority of offenders were low-level drug users. It was the criminalization of addiction. This was the peak of the war on drugs, and the highest arrest category back then, one of them, one of the highest arrest categories in the history of criminal justice was weed possession. Young people with weed. So I saw the average arrest was a black kid or a Mexican kid with a little bit of weed getting a two to five year sentence. And the prisons were getting $50,000 of taxpayers' money per year per prisoner. So who are the easiest people to arrest? Young people with weed. Before they introduced the private prisons and the drug laws were tightened, women typically didn't go to prison. It's rare they're out robbing banks, pedophilia, raping people, that kind of stuff. But when the, all this was introduced, women became the fastest growing prison population. Hundreds of thousands of women in prison now, non-violent drug offenders. If you're familiar with Black Lives Matter, they didn't matter at all. I saw a black guy get sentenced, a Vietnam vet, had been shot in the head by a sniper, Purple Heart Medal for Bravery, he was unemployed, the prosecutor said in the court at the hearing. He's got a nice new car, crumbs of cocaine on the car. He must be a drug dealer. The judge was like, bam, sent him away for years just like that. Didn't matter what he'd done for his country. So America now has got one in 100 adults in prison. For adult black males, it's one in 20-something. 20 25% of the world's prison population. And they've already begun to bring this system here. They tried to build the biggest kids' prison in the Western world in this country last year. It was going to get 70,000 pounds of your taxpayers' money per year per kid. They estimate half of young people in this country experiment with drugs. They can fill it with young people on drugs all day long. It went to House of Lords, and one of the Lords said, is this something we're going to be proud of? And they stopped it. But there's some politicians and corporations making tens of billions a year off these contracts right now. They're still trying to get it pushed through. So back when I was in the cell with Long Island, he suggested I write a blog about how the prisoners were buying items from the inmate store and making their own syringes. I should have known better about writing anything about the drugs business because that's the absolute priority of the gang. Now, that blog got posted online and a prisoner's family member sent a photocopy of it in and a shot caller, a gang leader on a neighboring yard put out a green light to have me killed or attacked for putting out their secrets. So for two or three days on my yard, all hell is breaking loose. Half the yard want to attack me and kill me, and the other half of the yard are protecting me because the characters I've been writing about at my blog are starting to get letters, pen pals, and books sent to them from all over the world. We're filling the prison library up. Had some real Shawshank Redemption moments. The blog had actually become a bridge, not only for me, become a bridge for the other prisoners. Two Tonys thought it was the coolest thing in the world. A teacher out of Singapore could write him a letter, ask him about his mafia life. He thought he would never speak to anyone outside of the prison walls again because he was doing 141 years. He was eligible for um, release after 112. So all hell's breaking loose on the yard. A guy with a shank comes to my cell. I had a former ex-Marine friend who knocked him out. Bud, the original cell might have got, and his buddy Ken, who attacked me when I was on the way to the visit, they're telling the guard to pop my door open. I'm so scared now, I'm not even coming out for a shower. They're telling the guard to pop my door open. That would need a shower. Guard's popping my door open. I'm popping it back closed. They're trying to push my door back in and get me. So I'm thinking, you know, something really bad's going to happen to me right now. And my, my parents were visiting again. All these bad things always happen when my parents fly thousands, thousands of miles to see me. It's, you know... Really stress, the stress on them I, I, was one of the things that I really regretted the most, as well as the harm that I caused to society by getting people involved in drugs. So in the end, after this three-day period, two Tonys call in a favor, and the green light to have me killed or attacked was squashed, and everything calmed down just like that, because like I said, he had so much respect in the prison system. And the jail, the notorious jail that I've been writing about, it was closed down, but that sheriff, Sheriff Joe Arpaio, was running half a dozen jails. And he just basically opened a new high-tech house of horrors down the street. So a lot of that stuff was still going on. But in the last election, Sheriff Joe Arpaio did get kicked out of office. 
And then, because he's a big-time racist, he was found guilty for contempt of court in the federal system for racial profiling. And he was looking at spending six months in his own jail. But then Donald Trump pardoned him, so he won't be doing any time. And now he's announced that he's running for Senate, so he may have more power than ever before. But my biggest lesson, one of them, was about helping other people. Like I said, the, the blog became this bridge, and it opened my heart to see the suffering of the prisoners. The prison was the biggest house of the mentally ill. Like I mentioned, all the racism, all the people in there with the addiction issues. Hearing their sad stories traumatized as kids. They were on the heroin to deal with the trauma, and then society puts them in a prison where we re-traumatize them and expect them to get out and be model citizens when we're treating them like animals. It's just not working except for the private prisons. So that, hearing the sad stories, opened my heart to what was going on in the world, and it sent me on this positive path as an activist. And my main job now is helping young people to try and avoid them getting into my situation. I do over 100 talks a year across the country at schools and colleges, scurring the living daylights out of them with some of the stuff that you guys have heard today in the hope they won't get involved in drugs and crime. Thank you for your time. Cheers.